On this week's Case of the Week, I wanted to give you a restorative update. I know it looks like I'm just showing you a picture of uh, Megan and I. In fact, if you didn't know better, we look like uh, either, uh, I don't know if we look like a married couple here. Actually, we look like a married couple that's super angry at each other, giving each other fake smiles. Um, I wanted to give you a restorative update. We kind of do this once a year on the show, and it's just interesting to kind of see how um, our business evolves. And again, keep in mind that uh, here at Glidewell, we work with dentists in all 50 states. Uh, California is our biggest state, Texas number two, New York number three, New Jersey number four, Michigan number five. So it's not just the West Coast, not just the East Coast. It's spread all across the United States. So when you look at the types of restorations we do, it's fairly well representative of what the dentists of America are doing. And so we're gonna look at a retrospective that goes back uh, eight years, starting in 2007. And first thing we're gonna look at as a category is PFMs. And you can see the trend here uh, if you go back to 2007, uh, about 65% of the crowns that we made here were PFMs. In fact, the graph gets too big, but if you go back 10 more years to 1997, it's up about 74, 76%. And so it had slowly kind of been coming down. And you can see going from 2007 to 2008, it goes from 65% down to about 62%. And then in 2009, we see a little more of a drop. So it gets below 60% to the first time to 57%. And then in 2010, boom, drops all the way to 45%. And then in 2011, down to about 31%. 2012, 22%. Now it's dropping uh, precipitously. 2013, 18% of crowns and bridges were PFM. Uh, 2014 down to about 12% and now in 2015 year to date it's at 10.5% so where's it going to be in 2016 I think it's pretty clear that for the first time ever we're going to see that less than 10% of the crowns and bridges that we make here at the lab are in fact going to be porcelain fused to metal so what happened to the PFM you know has the quality in the PFMs dropped from 2007 to now uh, did the ADA or the CDC or the FDA come out with a warning statement that PFMs cause, uh, say, premature hair loss, for example, or a double chin or ED? These are just random things I'm throwing out. No, in fact, the PFMs here were actually way better than they were 20 years ago when PFMs were, you know, 90% of the crowns made and the other 10% were cast gold. The porcelains on PFMs are actually kinder to opposing teeth than they were 20 years ago as well. Nothing happened to the PFM. It didn't change at all. What changed was the rise of the all ceramics. Um, there's a lecture that I'm currently giving called the monolithic revolution. And the reason I titled it that is because the monolithic restorations, the first one that was launched in 2007 and the second one that was launched in 2009 are the reason for the rapid decline of the PFM. So if you look at this 10.5% of restorations that we do that are still PFMs, uh, a full 65% of this 10.5% are bridges. And so the majority of the PFMs that we do today are bridges, and that's still what I use PFMs for. I haven't done a single unit PFM since 2009. I haven't had a need for a single unit PFM since 2009, but PFM bridges, I definitely still have need for because the all ceramic bridges that we have today, which should be really strong, aren't still break a little more often than PFM bridges do. So let's scoot this over and we'll look at the all ceramic category. And uh, if we go back to 2007, you can see it's about 22% of the restorations that we were doing. So in 2007, it was still a PFM world. It was mainly PFMs being done with a few all ceramics. Uh, this was the year, 2007, that Emax was introduced. And so these numbers began to climb a little quicker than they had in the past. 2008, we get up to uh, oh, about 27%. 2009, it hops up to about 32%. This is the year that Bruxer was introduced. So Emax introduced in 2007, uh, Bruxer Solid Zirconia introduced in 2009, and boom, that's where you get that really big bump going to 2010, up to 48%, and then another huge one in 2011, up to 65%, and then another big one up to 75%. Uh, and then as it moves on, uh, we get to uh, 2011, 2012, we get up to 82%, and then Finally, in 2015, uh, where we are now year to date, 86.8% of the restorations of the crowns and bridges that we're making today uh, in the laboratory. And again, we're averaging over 100,000 crowns and bridges per month. 
86.8% of that all ceramic. So it's mind boggling to me as a dentist who's been a dentist for 27 years to see this because all ceramics were always these, you know, little niche products that we used for veneers on anterior teeth when we didn't need a lot of strength, but we did need aesthetics and we knew we had to bond them into place, which was going to be a pain in the butt, but we had to do it because the materials weren't very strong. And to see this rise, to see it dominate at, at the expense of the PFM, has been amazing and it took two amazing materials to do that. Uh, Emax lithium disilicate, which in 2007 was released as a monolithic material. Keep in mind Emax had two previous incarnations. The first one was Empress II, released around you know 1996, 97. That was a bilayered material, lithium disilicate framework with a ceramic on the outside of it. That kind of quietly went away. It was re-released as IPS Eris, which was a lithium disilicate framework with porcelain on the outside of it. Same kind of thing. There was debonding issues uh, between the ceramic and the lithium disilicate. And the genius move was when it was released in 2007 uh, as a monolithic material where the whole thing was made out of lithium disilicate. And Dennis instantly knew this was a different, pro a different product uh, that looked just as good, if not better. Didn't need to be prepped as much. And then in 2009, uh, kind of based on the same concept of take the porcelain off the lithium disilicate and make the whole crown out of it, uh, we introduced Bruxer, the concept being take the porcelain off the porcelain fused as zirconia crown and build the whole crown out of zirconia. And these two monolithic materials, they're solid materials with no porcelain on them whatsoever, are what really revolutionized uh, the lab industry and took the PFM from our, our steady stalwart crown that made up the bulk of what we've done in dentistry since, say, 1959 all of a sudden down to almost being on the endangered species list. You know, we're going to get to a point here where it hits around 5% or, or 6%, I think, as this really kind of starts to bottom out because these monolithic restorations, in my mind, are always superior because there's no outside layer of porcelain to chip or break off of here, and we don't have to reduce as much. You know, for a PFM, we have always asked, so and so has every lab and all the ceramic manufacturers, have asked for two millimeters of occlusal reduction, ideally 1.5 minimum. Now we look at a material like Emax, it's 1.5 millimeters of reduction, ideally one millimeter minimum, or we look in 2009 at solid zirconia, which is ideally one millimeter of reduction, 0 0.6 minimum. And we can see these monolithic restorations are much more conservative in their preparation requirements than these bilayered restorations. So it's not just PFMs, it's also lava crowns and Procera. Anytime you fuse porcelain to some underlying substructure, whether it be metal, zirconia, or even lithium disilicate back in the day or alumina, um, you're going to need to reduce more tooth and make room for both of those layers. So this really is a story about the rise of the monoliths, which sounds like some crazy sci-fi movie, but it's these monolithic restorations that dentists have started to rely on. The interesting thing is that our fracture rate for zirconia is the lowest for any product we've ever had in the lab with the exception of cast gold, because that of course doesn't break. And Emax does very well too. And it's both of these monolithic materials will outperform these bilayered materials. As we go to full cast gold, poor full cast gold, you know, it, it's not like it was super popular back in 2007. It started off under 10%, but now it's down to 2.3%. Gold hitting $1,800 an ounce didn't help. Uh, incre increased aesthetic awareness on the part of the patient hasn't helped. I have a very hard time finding uh, women, for example, or even most men here in California that will allow me to put full cast gold uh, into their mouth. And then lastly, we have composites. These used to exist uh, kind of as a cheaper crown. Dennis kind of wanted something that was cheaper than a PFM or an all ceramic crown. Uh, would in fact maybe order a composite crown or maybe inlays and onlays. But today with the ability to do bulk fill composites chair side on almost any class two preparation, lab fabricated composites are essentially a dead category and unfortunately you'd almost have to call full cast uh, a dead category too which is unfortunate since it is the best restorative material we've ever had in dentistry it's hard it, it hurts my heart to see it this low but the reality is for with solid zirconia for example on molars we can do almost everything we can do with cast gold and even in cases where it doesn't look like a dead ringer for a tooth or it doesn't look as good as emax Every patient will tell you 
that even a, a solid zirconia crown that doesn't look like a natural tooth looks a heck of a lot better than flashy gold sitting in their mouth. So it's hard to create value for this uh, for a patient. So I wanted to give you this uh, update now that we're midway through uh, 2015. We're, we're six months through here and show you that this amazing trend just continues where the bi-layered restorations, the most popular of which is the PFM, uh, is now down at 10.5% for our crowns and bridges. And the amazing rise of the monoliths, this very first chart is when Emacs again was released and here was the release of Bruxer almost 90% of the crowns that we're now making. And I realized that because of who we are, because we're Glidewell and we were, you know, obviously so involved with introducing Bruxer, that these numbers are probably higher than they are at other laboratories if you were to look at smaller laboratories across the US. Um, but considering how many labs are getting involved with CAD CAM design and milling restorations, it certainly seems that the rest of the lab industry is gonna follow these numbers as well. And being able to put you know, solid zirconia on molars, being able to put Emax on anterior teeth or Bruxer anterior now on anterior teeth. There's no reason to think that this all ceramic category is gonna to continue to dominate. And again, I see the one place where the PFMs uh, are going to continue to have some relevance is going to be with bridges. So as this number drops down, it's gonna be because less single unit PFMs are done, but I can see this bottoming out around 7% because if you're still gonna do a six unit bridge or an eight unit bridge, any kind of big bridge like that, that's asking a lot of solid zirconia. If you're gonna to try to do it out of that, my preference is still do it out of PFM because we can make that metal framework so much smaller than we can with zirconia. So I don't think PFMs will ever die completely we might be able to even reinvent them and find a stronger veneering material to put on the outside of it and get some better strength results. But I think it's clear, monolithics, if we're able to use them in a particular clinical situation, are always gonna be preferable than a bi-layered restoration because they allow us to be uh, more conservative. And since they don't have a metal substructure that we have to opaque out, they're gonna be more aesthetic as well.